So we played like four or five songs for him. He was like, stop, stop, stop. And we were like, oh, crap. That was fun. He was like, this is awesome. I've actually got a meeting with Warner Chapel, which is a publishing company I'm partnering with. Their whole staff's coming into my studio this afternoon. Why don't y'all get some lunch? I want y'all to play for him today. Kick the tires and start the fake fire. It's time to camp. Today, we welcome a very special guest, Trip Howell, drummer for country sensation Lenko. Now, I'm going to probably mix this up, but Lenko is winner of the new group of the year for the ACM. Got it. ACM. Also, he is a passionate advocate for airing Christmas music far earlier than would be considered culturally acceptable. <laughs> He's a passionate fishing advocate as well, and we welcome him to the fire today. Trip, thank you for joining <laughs> us on the show. That was, a, that was an awesome intro. <laughs> <laughs> we try to make you look good, man. We'll see. I like so. the Christmas music. You know, a lot of people don't know that about me. I'm actually, I'm obsessed with Christmas. It's like a, uh, a weird thing, which I'm sure a lot of people are, but I just love, dude, there's nothing better than like watching Netflix while having a christmas tree on like i think my wife and i took our christmas tree down in may of <laughs> this year so netflix and chill means something radically different for you it's basically watching christmas movies sometimes yeah all year long yeah uh have you started watching christmas movies already because it is it is december now yes absolutely um i think we started watching you know it's funny <laughs> every once in a while in the summertime like it'll be midsummer and it's hot outside and I'll turn it to Hallmark just to see if Christmas movies are on. And they are. And I'm like, what in the world, man? This is awesome. I think I'm going to keep it here and watch two or three Christmas movies. All right. So give us a, give us a, just a couple. What are, in the Howell household, what are some Christmas classics, things that you will bring your children up to appreciate? Well, definitely, you know, all the Home Alones. That's obviously Christmas. With Wait, all of them or just because there's four well, yeah, of them. The first two. Yeah, right. The, sure. the actual canon of Home Alone. The other two are sort of right. extra biblical. You don't really need them. Right, right, right. Okay. right. Yeah, at, at some point it kind of lost its... Well, thing. at some point the kid's old enough, right, where it's like you could be alone. Right, You right. know. But for sure, Elf, uh, The Christmas Story. One of my favorite movies is The Nightmare Before Christmas. Really? Which is more like a Halloween Christmas movie. Okay, not my favorite. My favorite, like, holiday movie. You know what I mean? Um, there's some cool, I don't know, man, anything Christmas like, dude, I could sit there and watch every cheesy Hallmark movie. That's like, you know, some girl goes to this weird town. Some guy that is, works at the dollar general or whatever is going to teach her the true meaning of Christmas. And she never moves back to New York. I could watch that storyline all day. See, that'd be great if we were sponsored by Dollar General, but bring that in there. Right? You're right. <laughs> so, Dollar General. <laughs> the meaning if, if of Christmas wanna... by Dollar General. <laughs> <laughs> you want to sponsor me, I'll take it. That's right, man. We'll have to we'll work on that. All right. So obviously we are we're kind of camping here. We're in beautiful Brentwood, Tennessee right now mm -hmm. in a parking lot. It's a lot um, more mountainous than I remember it. But. Yeah, I know. It is a little different, but uh, it's, people don't really recognize this as the backdrop for Tennessee, but that's where it is today. <laughs> and uh, so... We like to get into nature right away on this show. Do you, what's your relationship with nature growing up? Were you a camper? Did you like going outdoors? Yeah. Um, my parents live, we, I'm from Dalton, Georgia. It's a small town in Georgia. And beside our house are, is this like wooded area. It's probably like 30, 40, 50 acres of just woods. And so growing up, I mean, my brother and I, we would go dirt bike, four wheeling, make trails. You know, we built a tree house out there. And we're just always outside. But the thing that I love most about the outdoors is fishing. Like, I, it, most like I might go fishing after this interview. Uh, I do it, you know, when we're touring, I, I kind of do it a little bit less, you know, maybe a couple days a week. But since I've been home, like, I fish every day, every other day. That's what I, I love being on the lake. I don't know why. There's just something addicting about you know, being out there and, you know, the sun's coming up or it's going down or, you know, you're just out in nature away from everything. I don't know. Um, 
I don't know if that's like my way of getting close to God or just my obsession with trying to catch a fish. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> you know, somewhere in between there is the reason I love it. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what I do. That's my, me and nature get along through fishing. Well, that's, so as someone um, in California, I don't, do you need a license to fish here? Because in California, mm -hmm. you're required to get a day license to fish. And even then, I don't know where I would go fishing. Uh, uh, Y'all have a lake out there called Clear Lake. Okay. Um, I've got a buddy who, uh, his name's Aaron Britt. He's on the FLW tour and uh, he lives out in California. You know, he, he tours mostly uh, the Southeast, but he, uh, he said, you know, he sends me these pictures all the time of these fish he's catching on Clear Lake. I believe y'all have the world record spotted bass out there. Really? Yeah, I believe it came out of Clear Lake. Don't quote me, but I think I think it did. So another reason to be proud of my California heritage. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So when you go fishing, because I, I do, I actually do enjoy fishing when I get to go. And mm -hmm. I, I actually, I got to go. My parents took me fishing when I was about. I don't know, maybe 11 or 12. And we w went down to the southern tip of Mexico in mm -hmm. Zihuatanejo. Yeah. And I caught a barracuda. Oh, wow. And that was really cool. And I think one thing always surprised me is you think like, it's a fish, like I'm so much bigger than it, but it's like pure muscle. Yeah. And when you actually try to bring it out, like you, it's you versus something that is just objectively all muscle tissue. And it's hard yeah. to like wrestle it out. And I enjoyed that part. Like there's nothing mm -hmm. like when you like, Oh, you feel it's going and then you like, you know, you wrestle it in. It's like, Dude, there's victory. no better feeling than like setting the hook and feeling it wiggle a little bit. It's like, Oh, I don't know what it is. I about think we it. just lost PETA as a sponsor. So, <laughs> so now are you catch and release or do you yeah, uh, catch and release? Okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, you know, and I'll, especially this year because we haven't been on the road as much. I'll, uh, I'll fish tournaments, which are like, you know, best five fish. Uh, they're like four or five hours and uh, a lot of times they're either early morning or late at night uh, and it's for, you know because we haven't due to the coronavirus we haven't been able to play a ton of shows it's been really nice to have that outlet it's kind of like a jolt of adrenaline um, that m kind of makes up for not being able to play a show at night uh, that I think I like about that you know the competitive I'm, I'm super competitive I always have been and so being able to compete fishing has just been like a cool thing to kind of dive into over the course of the last six months. Do you feel it's a fair competition, you versus this fish underwater? Um, I mean, do you like, it feels like the odds are pretty stacked in your favor. Yeah, well, you know, uh, it's a lot harder than you think, especially okay. in a lake. Uh, to make a piece of plastic look like a real creature that a fish would eat, that's difficult. But yeah, I mean, there's only so many places these fish can go. However, there's only so much area you can cover in That's one right. night. So, you know, the more I think about it, fishing is, it's, it's, it is kind of a sad thing because it's like you're driving a hook in a fish. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's awesome. All right. So let's go back to Dalton, Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for the fans at home, Dalton is known as uh, the capital of a particular industry mm -hmm. in the, in the country. So perhaps you could yeah. illuminate that for us. Yeah. My, most of my family uh, is in carpet. It's, it's the carpet capital of the world. And, you know, growing up in Dalton, you don't realize that it Dalton is actually known for carpet. You know, because when we tour, you know, we'll go out to San Diego and I'll meet someone new and they'll be like, you're from Dalton, the carpet capital? I'm like, how do people know that Dalton is the carpet <laughs> capital? Um, but, you know, it's most of my family's in carpet. Um, you know, my dad, granddad, they all have owned stores, work for people, you know, buy and sell carpet, all that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's kind of if you if you're from Dalton, you most likely have some sort of connection to carpet. So growing up in the carpet capital, another sponsor idea too. We should see, you know, you got any super carpet superstores yeah. down there, you yeah. know, Lanco would be perfect for that. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so seeing where you are now, are, do you ever wake up and go, oh my gosh, I'm a, I'm a country star, but I'm from the carpet capital. Like, how did I get here? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm in a band. Uh, so there's five of us and you never really feel like you made it you know what i mean does that make sense like you never really feel like um you're this star or even you know we'll go 
it's funny we'll go to these places and the venue will sell you know been sold out for weeks and i'll go up to our tour manager and be like mark is anyone coming tonight did we sell tickets and he'll be like dude it sold out three weeks ago and you know you never really feel like um that you're above anybody else you know it's it's interesting because like when we have a real good group of guys um we've been together for a long time and we kind of started from the ground up you know we didn't we started touring before we had anything and we played for so many nights to maybe five people and that's including three bartenders um what's that like when you play to a is that just you're covering in a bar and just you know just kind of well, there you know for us it was like after a few beers it just became a free rehearsal or a paid rehearsal depending <laughs> on if we we're making any money that night um but when you it's interesting because when you come from that and then you, you know we had radio success and then we kind of been able to go out and do our own tour in theaters and sell a lot of tickets you still feel like that you still feel like there could only be two people here tonight and so it's it's that th it's always i don't know if it's a fear if it's just you know some days i will wake up every once in a while and be like golly i play music for a living and i'm like super thankful for that and but then you know most days you wake up and you just feel like everybody else you know like like my homies that i grew up with i talk to them you know once a week i'm no different from them i just play music I've always been curious too, because obviously it seems like there's a deep camaraderie mm -hmm. with the creative community of musicians and artists. You all yeah. appreciate and you root for each other when you make it. And yeah. it seems like, especially in, in the country music, it seems like everyone's really on the same team. Uh, you mentioned being super competitive. Is there also a competitive streak too, where there's like, do bands have other bands or like, oh, that band's kind of in our space and like it's kind of a friendly rivalry when they do well or something? I don't, I don't, I think there is aspects of that. Um, you know, in country, so different because it's like I, I don't know that um, I, I don't really know anybody that I would consider like a rival or anything like that. But I do think you know you do you want everyone to be successful, obviously that that is doing it and that are your friends. But you also you know do want your song to work on radio or your you know tour to sell or whatever it may be. So. I think there is always that aspect of, you know, I want everyone to succeed and I want us to succeed. I think there's, that's the cool thing about country music is there's so many different sounds. Like you don't just have pop country. You don't just have um, rock country. You don't just have um, classic country. There's room for everybody, you know, all the way that covers the entire spectrum of uh, country. You know, you have guys that just write love songs. You have guys that are just sad, that have like more of a sad catalog. You have guys that rock you know and there's room for all of it and so um the biggest thing is i think uh i don't necessarily know that obviously i i'm sure that there are moments of like um uh, wanting to compete but in it when it comes to competing with art it kind of gets like why you know like they they do their thing we do our thing we don't really have anything to right. do with each okay. other so it's like uh, and it, it's funny, you know, on those award shows, um, we've, we've been nominated for several awards and, and um, haven't won. And you're not really, like, upset that you didn't win. You, you know, it's a lot of times for us, especially, like, we were just thankful that we were in the category, period. You know, like, to, to be nominated with, you know, four of the top groups of the year is, like, you know, a lot of times we're just sitting there going like, God, I cannot believe that our name is being called next to Little Big Town, Lady Annabellum, or Old Dominion. You know what I mean? So it's a, uh, there's not really necessarily a competitive edge to that, I don't think. Now, you may interview somebody else and they may be like, that's all I want to do is win. But when it comes to art, it's like, I kind of just want to make what we like and go play to our fans. That's awesome, man. So as a drummer, I'm curious, were you any sort of uh, childhood prodigy? When did you learn to play the drums? Uh, yes, I am uh, a prodigy. No, That's I'm just right. kidding. No, I, um, so I can, I can remember, I was thinking about this on the way over here because I was, you know, wondering if you're going to ask that question. Well, look at you just, you know, forecasting on yeah, that, right? Yeah, just thinking about my answers and talking to make sure I don't sound stupid. 
Um, we can do, we can edit anything out. So don't, <laughs> don't you worry. No, I'm Mark not. will make anyone sound smart. Yeah. Hey. He does good luck. With, he does it with me every time. <laughs> um, so my mom, I remember a long time ago. I was probably like twelve or something like that, asking my dad for a drum kit, and he told me when pigs fly. Um, and you know, my dad's always been supportive of my career, but I did what any logical kid would do and went and asked my mom for a drum kit. <laughs> and she was like, you know, I will get you a drum kit for Christmas if you will, if you promise that you will play in church. And so um, I kind of just, she bought me a drum kit for Christmas and I just started sitting at the house. I think we had the cops called on us the first year I had a drum kit, maybe five or six times. Like they would show up. <laughs> I would be like playing in the back. We had this like little shed in the back, like a garage type thing. And I would be playing at the house and they would just walk in like cops would just walk in. And I'm like a 12 year old kid playing drums. Um, From noise complaints. Yeah. And they were like, here's the funny part. These drums were not expensive. They weren't very loud. You just could barely hear them. So who was calling neighbors. the cops on you? It had to be one of the neighbors, one of the three neighbors that it could have been. So Mr. Paul lived beside us. I doubt it was him. He was older. Now it could have been his wife. She she might not have liked that. Um, <laughs> or it could have been people across the street. Anyhow, I I um I started playing and I was just kind of you know trying trying to find my way. And I remember the first time playing in church um, was a big deal for me. And believe it or not, you know a lot of these guys in Nashville most of us grew up playing in church because when you start playing at 12, 13, 14 years old, you're, if you join a band, you're, where are you going to play? Like there's not really venues for 14 year old kids can go play music. I mean, there are maybe a few, but not where I'm from. Um, and then, um, so when you, you start playing at that age, church is kind of the only outlet to, to kind of work on your craft. And what's cool is like, you know, you might show up that morning and learn four new songs and then have to play them on the fly. Really? You know? Yeah. So I think that's I think that's why how a lot of musicians kind of get decent at their craft and start honing that honing it in is they're playing at church um, in in smaller towns. So um, yeah, I, my parents got me a kid. I started playing, and you know, I, I love sports growing up. So like, I played sports, and at nighttime I'd go home and hit the drums and. I kind of did that all throughout high school and college. Just I always loved drumming. It was something I did um, when I wasn't doing school or sports or anything like that. That's awesome. And all right, so you're playing in church, and then did the, had the when did the thought go? Okay, you know what? I'm. This is more than a hobby for me. This is something I'm going to get really serious about. I think I was a senior in college, um, and I was getting ready to graduate, and I was like, you know, the only way that I'm going to do this is if I just do this. However, coming from where I come from, it's like, dude, where do you even begin to get in with music? Like, how do you start a career in music? Now, were you playing all throughout college as well? Were you doing, Yeah. like, were you in any, did you have any, like, friend groups that you were part of? Or like, I had a couple guys that I would get together and jam with. And what's interesting is uh, the guy that ran our dorm would let me play I kept the drums in my dorm room and he said I could play from Saturday till from like one to eight or something like that. So he gave me like an eight hour period once a week where I could drum. Um, and I would, you know, there were a couple of churches there that I would go play for from time to time. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, I don't, I don't forgot what we were saying there. So, so, I'm, so basically drum, you, once you picked up the drumsticks at 12, it kind of, you carried that through and that was always kind of just something you loved doing and kept doing all throughout college. Yeah, yeah. And in your mind, if you was, mu- so you're saying music was potentially an option, but did you have another path where you were, I obviously I've heard you mention that you aspired to be a professional basketball player, but if it wasn't drummer or basketball player, was there another, were you going to go the corporate route or go I got to go on business? record. I have to go on record and say, I'm not sure where and when I said in an interview that I would be a professional we basketball player. We would be happy player. to furnish you with a copy. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure I did. Oh, I'm, you did. I'm absolutely positive. Um, if I were 6'8", I would have definitely tried to play basketball in the NBA. Um, but no, I, you know, you don't, there was a, 
there was a period after college that I moved back home for about eight months or so and my brother and I were in a band and we were trying to make things happen out of out of Georgia and um, you know it, it's just such a difficult field to get into because you don't know who to contact how to get in touch with people and and I worked a job while I was doing that you know it was my first year out of college and luckily my wife got accepted into Belmont to get her doctorate in physical therapy and at the time we weren't married but we we're getting ready to get married um, and moved to Nashville and like a week or two before that I met this dude um, and we were he was kind of in this same at this studio that I was working out of that he had worked in in Cleveland Tennessee um, his name was Brandon he was like you know I'm moving to Nashville I, I'm, I want to start like a country band this kind of thing I was like, cool, you know, that sounds awesome. I'll be moving to Nashville, too. You know, at the time, we weren't even going to play music together. We were just going to hang out. And um, he, I can remember driving into Nashville, like, with stuff in the truck, like a truck full of stuff. <clears throat> and I got a phone call from Brandon. He was like, hey, dude, um, and he's the lead singer of our band. He was like, hey, dude, I don't know anyone in town. Uh, do you want to get together tonight and hang out? I was like, yeah, man, I mean, we're going to be moving in, you know, this evening, but let's go grab a drink somewhere, get dinner or something like that. And so we just became good friends, man. We were, you know, we'd, we'd hang out. At the time, he didn't have a band yet, and he was constantly writing songs and was talking about, um, you know, what he wanted out of his band. And I was talking about mine and my brother's band, and we were, we were trying to make that successful and just always bouncing ideas off of each other. And one day he came over to the house and uh, we'd been friends for probably about eight months to a year. And he came over to the house and he had his laptop with him. He's like, hey, what do you think about these songs? And he played me four songs. And I was like, dang, dude, I'll drum for you if you <laughs> want me to. Like, I'll join your band. And he was like, all right. And I'd sold my drum kit to move up to Nashville. So I didn't have one at the time. Um even though I'd played all throughout high school and college, I didn't you have sold a, your drum kit. There was like a four month period that I didn't have a drum kit. And, um, cause you know, we didn't have much money. My wife was getting her doctorates. I was working at this, uh, oddly enough at this carpet warehouse, like helping my dad had got me that job when we moved up here. <clears throat> and so I was, uh, working at the time and we were trying to, you know, make ends meet. Um, but I told him, I was like, dude, I'll, I'll drum in your band. He was like, well, let's get you a drum kit and let's do it. And so, um, that's kind of how Lanco started. You know, we, this was probably eight years ago. We didn't have the band yet. It was just me and Brandon. And uh, about a month later, he was like, Hey, I might have this guitar player. And he called this guy named Eric that he had met. And Eric came over to, um, this little place that we we're practicing at. And it was just me, Eric and Brandon jamming. Um, and there we played three or four songs back then that made it onto our record, our first record. We we're playing We Do. Um, what was another one? There were a couple others. I can't think. Anyways, um, and then so from there, Eric knew Chandler and Jared. He went to school with them, and uh, so he brought them in one day, and we were just kind of jamming and hanging out, and you could just feel like this is cool you don't ever think like we're going to do this for a living. Like we're going to, us five guys are going to like create a business that has insurance and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you don't ever think that you're just like five young kids playing music at some random house. And so, yeah, we did that for like six months to a year. And, um, we kind of got to, um, became really good friends. And, um, I, I can remember Brandon writing Greatest Love Story. We were sitting on the back porch, and he was like, hey, I started this at the house. And at the time, th this is like one of our biggest songs, and at the time, he had like 10 verses for it. Like He was like, I don't know if that's one. Maybe this one. And he had written like 10 separate verses for that song. Wow. Um, but I can remember him playing that on the back porch and being like, dude, that song is incredible. Again, not thinking like that's going to go to radio and be like a triple platinum song, like anything like that. We were just dudes making music, you know? Um, and so that's, that's kind of, you know, from graduating college to moving 
to Nashville to starting the band. That's kind of the journey uh, in in short form. So, out of all the band members, do you all have sort of personas? Like, is one the wild guy, one the jokester, the prankster? Do you, <laughs> I, I'm curious what where in the band, where in the Avengers you fall. You know. Yeah, you know, um, it's been about eight months since we've toured, and my wife and I found out that we're having a, a child. Um, Congratulations! So I was gonna ask, I was gonna, in the family section. I was gonna ask you about that because uh, obviously you and a, a your fellow bandmate as well. Yeah, Brandon. Brandon. Well, Chandler is also pregnant, and Brandon just had his baby. Wow. So that's a great. Um, so it's a, the latest collabor Lanco collaboration. Yeah, I would say. You both um, have singles that are being released soon. <laughs> yeah, in May for sure. Hopefully they're <laughs> hits. Um, no, but uh, yeah, I, in my past life. I was probably more of the wilder one, um, but I could I felt myself over the last like year or two kind of slowing down, becoming more and more tamed. Um, and I don't know if that's just because I'm getting older or, or what it is, but um, we're all pretty even kill. I mean, like everybody in our band likes to have a good time. Obviously, there are some guys in the band that you know go to bed a little bit earlier, don't go to a bar or something. They they like to just kind of keep it themselves. And then there are a couple of us that we decompress by going to a bar after show or going and sitting in a circle with some friends and kind of hanging out and talking. Um, we decompress by talking more so than like sitting around and, and gathering our thoughts on our own. So, um, but yeah, I mean, dude, everybody in the band has their moment. Sometimes I don't go, do, want to do anything, but go back to the bus and lay in my bunk and watch Netflix, you know, or Christmas movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <sometimes. laughs> I love that image of a, country a uh, star drummer for a country band going home decompress and everyone else is hitting the town and you're at home watching the holiday yeah. or uh <laughs> home alone yeah yeah <laughs> no uh <laughs> yeah it's it's that's a i don't know what it is about christmas movies man there's just something that just calms my nerve when it's, i don't know if it's the spirit of it or what but like relaxing and just watching a christmas movie is like zero anxiety you know what i mean like Oh man, sounds like you gotta you gotta compose or score a uh, a Christmas movie soundtrack, Dude, man. I'm all about it, man. That I'm sounds that sounds like it. it. All right, so Lanco, you you found each other and you started going. And obviously, I've I've heard this story uh, from Brandon uh, on in interviews. But can you tell us a little bit about what what was it like? You guys were all practicing in an old carpet warehouse together yeah right? the, i worked at a warehouse and um at night we would go in i had the key to it and um we'd sneak in at night and just set our stuff up and play and we started and it was we did it for like two or three months and then it got to be like well let's just leave our stuff up here and cover it up no one ever comes up here until i got caught but you know it, it you did just, get caught i did get caught what yes. happened uh well my boss told me that um, he was kind of cool about it. You know, he was like, uh, you know, uh, you're in Nashville. I get it. Just uh, pick up all these beer cans that are sitting up, <laughs> <laughs> sitting around upstairs. Um, you know, I think in Nashville, everyone, if anybody's doing anything, most of the, a lot of the people um, want to do something with music eventually. And so uh, any sort of worker like, a lot of times someone that's, that's serving you a beer, or, you know, serving you food can probably sing better than you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, I think it's just one of those things. He, he was pretty cool about it. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't. And no also, one. I think I recall reading that you said this was particularly helpful in preparing you for any extreme because in the summer it would be unbearably hot. Yeah. The winter would be freezing as it is now in our campsite. And so you no, were basically dude, what are you talking to about, man? This fire is keeping us good and warm. I uh, know, carbon neutral too, man. There are no CO two emissions coming out of that fire. So. That's what I'm talking about, right? I low key need one of those in my living room. You know, it's funny. There's actually when we were researching these, there actually weren't that many to pick from. So there's a huge, wide open industry. Maybe we could do a collab on the official Lanco fire set. Yeah. You know, yeah. Have your own decompression. You know, watch a Christmas movie around a fake fire. We need to do, get like the Amish fire pit with like Lanco carved in it. <laughs> That's right. No, we can. We should, well, <laughs> we should talk about that afterwards. I love it. Um, all right. So you're practicing in a carpet warehouse, mm -hmm. and there's a particular experience that happens at a 
little big town uh, Keith yeah. Urban concert. And um, you know what's interesting, dude? Me and Brandon um, and the guys, we'd been trying to make something happen for a long time. And this town, man, it has a way of uh, wearing you down. You know, like a lot of people move to town and, you know, they work hard for three or four years and nothing ever happens and, and they keep going and nothing ever happens. And so you're not guaranteed anything, but it is like the, the two best pieces of advice I've ever gotten was if you stay in line long enough in this town, your number will get called. You need to be prepared once it does get called. Like you never know when it, when, you know, a, an agent or, uh, um, an intern's going to roll into some bar and see something in you that sparks the whole thing. Um, and so, dude, we, we spent hours and hours every single night working on our band sound. You know, like, we're a band, so we didn't want to sound like somebody else. We wanted our own original thing that fit in the country format. And, you know, in the wintertime, dude, it was literally like, a freezer so like if it were 32 <laughs> degrees outside it was 15 in the in the warehouse if it was 100 degrees outside it was 120 in the warehouse because it it Ooh. literally just retained whatever the hottest form of whatever was outside that sounds miserable dude so we have a buddy that's been around with us for a long time he has a, pic, a video of us playing in our underwear in the warehouse we're all just stripped down just sweating it out working on our music that sounds honestly gross like it's, it, it's disgusting i yeah, mean dude that sounds terrible that's you know that that's that played a role in us getting a record deal because um we uh there was a moment when we brandon was working at a little big town concert and uh um, at a concession stand right yeah he was selling hot dogs and beer and whatever else and this guy walked by and he just happened to notice him and was like dude that's jay joyce shut down his register and for any of you guys that don't know jay joyce is like one of our favorite producers he's a he's he does get like eric church brothers osborne kg elephant um he did a couple of little big towns records uh phenomenal producer and he walked by and brandon literally shut down his his stand ran up to him it was like jay jay and they had this little conversation and and you know jay was like what do you want to do kid and he was like well i want my band to be on country radio and be successful he's like all right, well, come play me some songs. So he was just cool about that. He wasn't like, I mean, how often does you, can you run up to someone and be like, hey, like, you know, I know I was over there right. at the concession stand, but uh, here I'm actually the, right. I'm actually a uh, aspiring country artist. Like, is that in Nashville? Is that okay? Is that considered cool? You like, know, it's one of those things. I don't know if it's necessarily considered cool, but it's a shoot your shot kind of thing. Okay. You know what I mean? Like. Uh, this this guy we've admired his records for so long that it was like yeah you just had brandon to. had the chance to talk to him and he shot a shot you know so he had a rendezvous with destiny he just had to go he yeah had to he, go do it. he went and 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 tracked him down and they talked for about 30 minutes and about a month later um he called jay joyce and jay was like well come play me some songs now that's the part that i think that the warehouse played a massive role in because if Brandon would have gone there and not had good songs, he may have never talked to him again. But Jay was like, all right, I dig this, dude. This is some good stuff. Bring the band over. I want to hear how y'all sound. And so we got in a room and played for him. And um, Were you nervous before that? It was, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know. But it was 72 degrees room temperature when you went in, so you knew you could handle it. Yeah, I mean, it was, the temperature in the room was. <laughs> was, was, was you're like, this is the nicest room I've played. The temperature, the temperature in my palms at the moment were, it was probably like 150 degrees. But um, no, it was, it was, it was an exciting nervousness. And I can remember Brandon was talking to me. He was like, man, you know, let's go have fun and play him some songs. The worst that can happen is that he says no, but forever we'll be able to tell our kids we played songs for a guy like this so we played like four or five songs for him he's like stop 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 and we we're like oh crap that was fun he was like this is awesome i've actually got a meeting with warner chapel which is a publishing company i'm partnering with their whole staff's coming into my studio this afternoon why don't y'all get some lunch i want y'all to play for him today dude and, and um, wow we were like oh okay <laughs> Um, so we went, you know, back into, he's got this little area in the back, the, you know, it's like a kitchen, hangout area, whatever. Light lunch, area. obviously, right? Yeah. 
had some lunch. And, no, no hot fried chicken. And uh, we were sitting there talking to Jay. You know, people from Warner Chapel were coming in, and we were sitting there talking to Jay. And Brown was like, what songs do you want us to play? And he was like, I don't know. You, What did you do for me? You play music, don't you? And we're, he was like, yeah. He was like, well, then go play music. I don't care. We went back in there and played some music. And um, Jay was like, this is the first group I'm signing um, in my publishing company. So that was real cool, man. Like a month later, Jay called. Once all the paperwork was done, Jay called and was like, hey, I have two weeks off starting Wednesday. It was a Monday. So I got two weeks off starting Wednesday. I want to do y'all's record. And we're talking like a whole record here. We'd already played him like eight or ten, maybe twelve songs. And he was like, I want you to come in. We're going to do that, do a record. So we all went to our bosses. And at the time, I was working at the carpet warehouse. And uh, I went to my boss, and I was like, hey, I need two weeks off. And he was like, that ain't going to work. And so I got fired. Everybody got fired. And um, we went and made a record. <laughs> wow. At the time, man. And there's – now – Working with a so you have a veteran producer who's uh, you know worked with some huge acts. Yeah. But even that, there's no guarantee of success, right? No. So you're you're gonna cut a record. You're in as good a spot as you can be, but it's an enormous risk to leave your job at this point. Yeah. Because you're like this record could go somewhere, or it could not, right? Well, and even if it did go somewhere, it was gonna take years. You know, like I think we cut that record in 2016. Now was that Hallelujah Nights? Is yeah. that the record that would go on to be Hallelujah Nights? Yeah. Okay. We cut that in 2016, and um, I think we added a couple songs like 2019, but it didn't come out till 2018. So 19. Just since I'm a I'm a bit of a music novice here, but so you go in the studio for two weeks and you record. Is the entire album recorded in two weeks? We did all. Yes, we did ten songs then, and then I think we went on. We we wrote a couple, you know, because we we got a record deal not short after that. Um, and we started doing like radio tour but we had written some more songs and we showed our record label and they wanted us to go cut some more so I think we did like once we, after we turned that complete thing in they loved the whole record signed us because of that I think we did like three or four more songs after that um, what is the normal because two weeks is aggressive to record that many songs right and, uh... yeah um, not I mean we, we, we average about a song a day we can do okay. a, a full song a day, um, and that for a record you're looking at ten to eleven songs. So you need fourteen, fifteen days. And then how long does it take after you record it to mix and master and do all the the wonderful producing that goes into it, and then have it ready for delivery? Well, for Jay, when we cut that, it probably took him three or four months of just because I mean he was doing other projects as well. Okay. So in his in his spare time. You know, we weren't bringing him any money. We weren't signed to a record, doing anything like that. He kind of just worked on it when he had. So the y'all time. are taking the risk together. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Okay. That's it. And when you cut that record, did you have any idea that uh, one of those songs would go on? I mean, I just checked YouTube this morning; has 130 million <laughs> uh, views on it. We did not. I mean, again, like you, you don't ever think that anything's gonna work. I mean, like we were sitting there going like. When, when that song became a hit, we were like, what is happening? I mean, our world changed within the course of like three or four months. I mean, we, we, we were doing okay. You know, we'd built up a decent following. You were selling like four or 500 tickets a spot. And then we went from that to like selling 1,500, 2,000 tickets. And everything just kind of changed overnight. And, um, you know, we got like a tour bus. We got a crew. We got a light show. All this stuff just kind of started happening. And you just kind of were in that rhythm um, which that what's been interesting about this period of life where we haven't been touring for the last six to eight months is when I sit back and think about it, it's absolutely crazy. You know, all the stuff that we got to experience, but you're just in the middle of it. Like you're just go, 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 going. You never really stop and just think about how thankful you are to have any of that. You know what I mean? Cause it's wow. a, it's a constant busy lifestyle. I mean, like we would play, we'd have three shows and you're busing in between shows and then fly to San Diego, stay there for three days, play two shows, fly back up to, uh, fly to Europe, do a tour there, fly back, go to the ACM. Like you're constantly moving it when you're home. It's like two or three days to 
you know, do laundry and like catch up on your sleep. That's all it is. And so you're just constantly moving and moving and it's growing and you never really have time to like soak it in. You know what I mean? Hmm. Which this, this period of life has been cool to kind of sit back and soak it in and, and just kind of be thankful for what, what we've been able to do. Absolutely. So you have this album, you don't know how successful it's going to be. And then you obviously, the, the band has a unique distinction. I don't, I, I'd have to, I'll have to check this later, but as of right now, I believe you write the only, the, you were the first country band to have a number one single that would be released in pre-C before an album is actually released, right? Uh, On the country charts, right? Yeah, uh, it's either that or a gold. I think it went gold before the album was released, something like that. Uh, it was something very cool. Yeah, and that uh, was greatest sort of. love story. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and so that's that must have been a a pivotal point. But was when you guys won Group of the Year, our new Group of the Year um, at ACM, did that change things for you? Was that another massive shift? Yeah, it, you know that was um, that was a cool moment. And you know it's. It, if anything, like there are little moments like when you're playing a festival or something, when someone introduces you and they, and you have that title, they're just cool little moments where you're like, Oh yeah, we, we want an ACM, you know what I mean? And, um, but yeah, you know, every little accolade that comes along with the success, obviously I think, uh, helps you grow as a band. But the biggest thing that we try to focus on is, is our live show and fans you know like we love all the accolades don't get me wrong like i love the acm love the number one love everything about that but that's all pointless if you don't if you go to a venue and no one shows up yeah and so um the 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 biggest thing right now is like we're, i'm just hoping that something happens to where we can get back to tour next year because that's what we do we love touring we love the live show aspect you know, we do a bunch of crazy stuff live that um, that a lot of other acts don't necessarily do. Are but, you referring to the inflatable duck? Well, that that's one of them. That's a that's uh, during festival season. Um, you can look out around noon. A lot of times we'll play like seven or eight o'clock slot at a festival season. You can look out around noon or two o'clock and re know real quick if it's going to be an inflatable duck day. Um, <laughs> there there are just some festivals that you know going into it it's an inflatable duck day yeah. um but yeah we that's that's a uh, one of the things we, we brandon loves to crowd surf and so um that's one of his ways that seems to terrifying surf. to me like it, it i mean do you just have is it just hey we've built this rapport and crowd i trust you to like we all have a vested interest in getting me back <laughs> to the stage safely to well, continue the show that's right? kind of that's our tour manager mark he's one of the best in the country he that's kind of his Worry is like once that thing takes off, he 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 kind of. Yeah, how goes do you direct and, the crowd? Have you crowd surfed? I have, but not not um, on the duck. Well, how does that work? So do you uh, do you signal to the crowd I'm about to do this? And like I feel like you could this could go wrong very quickly. I think at a Lanco show, you know, there's some a lot of the indoor shows. There are just some nights that call for it, like you just know. There's not like a premeditated thing, um, and I and. At a Lanco show, if you see the duck, you know what's going to happen, you know? Um, and so there's not, I don't think there's, we, we started doing the duck because Brandon would crowd surf at these festivals like this. And I think he got tired of getting his junk touched, you know, people just like grabbing his butt and stuff like that. And I think he was like, dude, I need something. He was to being objectified on. by the crowd <laughs> and he didn't like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dude, he's lost so many we have these things they're like monitors that go on the back of our that's how we listen to each other and we put our ear like these headphones in and he's lost so many of those in the crowd crowd surfing and so so you we, just have one on standby when he gets returned how, how long do when you go out on your crowd surfing how long until the uh quote quote tide brings you back in you know i think it just kind of what's funny is with that section specifically when he's crowd surfing we are set up to jam as long as we need to till it comes back. <laughs> so sometimes it'll it'll go there and back and the jam's not as long. Dude, that thing's going all the way to the lawn seats and back and we just jam the whole time. That is amazing. I, I would I just I think my main concern is how do you do you just jump into the crowd? Is that 
Yeah, I mean, dude, it's... Because um, what if they... Do they ever miss and you just hit the ground? No, 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 no. Well, I'm sure that's happened. It hasn't happened to Brandon. Is there a certain size limit, you know? Like, are there... I always wonder, like, Clarence Clemens, you know, RIP, but uh, that was a, you know, giant, muscular, you know, you know, yeah. guy who, like, can he... You know, if he was going to crowd surf, I'd be like, hold up. But Whereas Paul <laughs> Simon is, like, five foot right. and probably 140 pounds, you know? Yeah, I, I, um, I don't necessarily know... This is like I guess there could be a a, a limit um, with us specifically. There hasn't ever been an instance where Brandon has gotten dropped or anything like that. Well, that's good. That's a, I, I would be terrified if I was a manager and I watched a, a key asset like that just take off. I'm like, hope it. Oh, dude, our tour manager all the time. I mean, there are notes out on. I mean, we do a bunch of crazy stuff. Like Brandon's climbed the rafters. We destroyed our guitars. Like. There's just moments when you're into it. There's just things that happen. You're like, it's just that kind of. So night. what prompts you to destroy your guitar? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't like. <laughs> there just been moments like, some shows Jared will get done in this part. He's our keys player, but he plays guitar on this song called Trailmaker. He'll just throw the guitar across stage. <laughs> I don't know what prompts you're, him to do that. You're painting the picture of what seems to be a highly risk environment it's like a, a very yeah, dude. it's a very dang, i'm like i feel like if i was applying for health insurance i should disclose whether i attend lanco concerts yeah it's it's um our live show man it's we wanted we set out a long time ago to build an experience you know like what was interesting when we started out we were playing like i said to two or three people and we would uh a lot of times they would be like eating cheese sticks like mozzarella sticks on a, at a table and Brandon was like, or looking at their phone, looking at cat videos. And Brandon was like, dude, how do we compete with that? And he was like, well, I'm going to go out in the crowd and beat a drum on their table. And I'm like, that'll get their attention. And so we kind of had that mentality, you know, going from two people at like this little restaurant slash venue to 50,000 people at this massive, massive festivals. Um, if you can take it to them, they'll pay attention. And so that, that's always kind of been our thing. You know, like when we do our headlining show, um, there's a segment where all five of us get in the middle of the crowd in these theaters and do like this little, it's kind of like this campfire sessions type thing where we'll play like a bunch of stuff that we would play if we were sitting around a campfire at the house and someone pulled out a guitar. So, um, yeah, dude, it's for us, we've always wanted to create an experience live. That's that's our our biggest advantage as a band. That's what we love yeah. to do. And and with the pandemic hitting like it is, that it kind of takes away the the heart the best thing we do. Hard to do that stuff over Zoom. Yeah, it doesn't translate. Yeah, it doesn't translate at all. What is I have to? I'm just I love hearing stories from the road. But uh, can you share something that maybe is past the statute of limitations and you know you won't be on the hook for of something crazy that's happened on uh, tour or a couple. Oh, uh, yeah. Some cool um, anecdotes from the road. Yeah. I, this didn't happen to me, but I've heard this story a bunch of times, so I want to tell it. Um, I believe it was Chandler. <laughs> and you got to know Chandler. He's, like, super quiet, super awesome dude. Um, and he was selling – this was early on. I think we were opening up for Old Dominion or something like that at this venue. And he was selling merch at our merch stand. And we just walked off stage, and we, we'd go out to the merch table and try and sell some merch. And this – bigger lady comes up and she's like hey um at least he thought she said can i see the small and he was like yes ma'am sure and gave her the small and she took her shirt off like just completely took it off bra and everything hanging out and then she had chandler she was like can you help me put this on and like had him try and put this small on this voluptuous lady <laughs> he was trying to put help her put a small lanco shirt on um i hear that story all the time and i remember like i was around but I, that wasn't my story um did it resolve i mean did uh, did they find the correct size or i remember she took that thing off and it didn't look like a small like it it, it had it was like stretched in weird places it went from like lanco to lanco <laughs> but um uh yeah, there that that was a pretty funny story. Um, man, what else? They're just 
You it's, love going to San Diego. Uh, yeah, and, dude. Oh my God, we love like we absolutely love San Diego. Um, we tour there a good bit, and w- what's cool is like I was telling you earlier, we literally, if we're going to San Diego, we will a lot time before or after to stay there for like four or five days, and we we've, we've rented like half the houses on Mission Beach. We found these two that we really like, and we'll go stay and take bring our wives up there and hang out. Um, we have spots that we go to regularly. Although, don't ask me the names because I can tell you exactly where they are and exactly what I get, but I don't know the names of any of the places. Um, yeah, dude, San Diego is one of the best. Wow, well, it's it is remarkable. Um, who do you love touring with? Uh, who is super fun? You've mentioned you guys have gotten yeah. to tour with uh, Miranda Lambert and Dirk Bentley and uh, Old Dominion. Like, who do you who do you love going on tour with? Yeah, man. Dirk's the Dirk's Bentley tour was like Camp Bentley. Um, it was the, one of the most phenomenal tours we've been on. Uh, we we were in the middle of a tour with with Miranda when this pandemic hit, and dude, that was some of the best times we've had. She sets up this little like, it's like a camper airstream, kind of like this, but it's a bar, um, and they have like if it's, it feels good outside, they'll set chairs up outside and make a fire out there every single night. Um, she ha- she'll have like karaoke night. She has these cool little things. Karaoke with Miranda Lambert, that feels unfair. Yeah, it yeah it, it does. Um, you know I I <laughs> last I, I go to I have one karaoke song um, that I go to and it's tequila, not Dan and Shay one, the one that you just say tequila like two times. The one yes, the one that I was about to say the instrumental one that yeah. has the brief tequila yeah. shout in the middle yeah. of it that's your it's always a song? hit dude it's always so what do you hit. do during the rest of the song you know that do 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 what do you do uh they just give them a little shuffle give them okay. a little give well, them a little dance you crowd surf <laughs> yeah <laughs> if there's a big enough crowd which there never is while i'm doing karaoke well, while you do karaoke that's a well i have to talk to our producer about that mark i feel like we're missing a bar on our campsite so maybe we yeah. gotta we you gotta definitely mi- you definitely need like a yeti ice down like a yeti right cooler here. yeah hey that's another great sponsor idea is yeah. yeti cooler right and, yeah a uh, couple of couple of cold ones in there It'd be great yes sir all right so obviously with covid touring not happening mm-hmm. uh where do you see the music industry going though next few years yeah um i think uh, you know once uh i think right now everyone's trying to make that connection online through instagram tiktok you know, Facebook, live streams, that kind of thing. Um, but you know, I think in the next year or so, it'll come back. I think it'll be uh, stronger than ever because I do think there's an aspect of live music that is such a escape yeah. from reality. And I think that it is needed for mental health, you know. Um, uh, it's one of the only things that I think that it's, it's kind of like sports. Like, it doesn't matter what you look like, where you came from, what you believe in. When you get in the room and you uh, are watching a band that you like, you're one with the room, with anybody in the room and the act. And so I think, uh, you know, as soon as we can get these cases down and, and you know, maybe a vaccine or whatever can can help uh, kind of bring some normalcy back, I think that the music industry will bounce back and, and live shows will be popping again. Yeah. Who would you love to collaborate with? that you uh have not had a chance to huh that's a good question um man there's there's so many there's so many because there's you know when you look at our band we obviously have a style so i think like there are a couple songs we have that i think like dual lipa or somebody like that would be really cool on um but then personally man like I don't know. I'd love to do something with like Bruce Springsteen or like. Oh man, are you a Bruce fan? Yes, Springsteen. Springsteen, the way he like just lowers the jaw. And I it's just... not, you know, with Bruce, there. It's not that he's like the the best singer per se. Um, he just has a conviction in his voice. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, there's, you know, growing up like, in country music, I grew up on like Eric Church. <laughs> you know, what I mean, like when I was coming up, Jason Aldean and Eric Church were hitting the scene. Um, and so, like, I never really, obviously, you know, all the older country songs, that kind of thing. But my dad just used to listen to classic rock. And, and there's a, there's just a warmth and there's a piece of that music that I, I think 
uh, Bruce is one that I kind of connected to early Absolutely. on uh, because I, it's almost like the killers are our generation's Bruce Springsteen. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like almost that there's an edge to him, but there's a piece that everyone can relate to. Absolutely. You know no, what I mean? Oh, man, this, that's so good. The saxophone solo in uh, Jungle Land is one of my all-time uh, yeah. favorites. And, I mean, Thunder Road, Born to Run. I mean, it's just, oh, Glory Days. I love Glory Days, too. Like, I do totally love the pop stuff. Like, Born in the USA, my mom would play that all the time outside because she would work outside by the pool, and, and Saturdays we'd clean and always would have Born in the USA on. And I just right. loved, oh, man. Let me fix my phone. That's a great album. Sitting here. Um, all right. Well, we've come to that point in our camping trip where it's time to delve a little deeper. There's an old Valerian proverb that says, s'more money, s'more problems. And so to solve s'more problems, we would like to know what is your perfect s'more? <laughs> You know, you were talking about it earlier and you told me some of the answers and um, I hate to be that guy. But um, to me, I think you have two graham crackers, right? My wife loves to make like the s'more completely, complete, like the, the marshmallow completely burnt. I like just a little bit of burn. Like, just a little bit. And the trick is not Hershey's chocolate. I think you got to get, like, some sort of, like, fancy dark chocolate that you don't know how to pronounce his name and that every Kroger has sitting up there that probably <laughs> is using the same ingredients, but it looks and sounds more expensive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you throw that on top of the, of the ha- on, like, not burnt, just kind of brown s'more and put the graham cracker on. And I think, to me, dude, that's money in the bank, like, don't mess with what's already great. Like if it's broke, don't fix it, right? A s'more purist. All yeah. Right. A, a man after my own heart. Okay. Through and through. I mean, um, like you. I'm glad. A- I'm, I think Hershey's chocolate is just like, you know, well, if they're a sponsor, it's wonderful. But I'm with you. There's just we could we could do better with. Uh, yeah, and not that, not that. It's not good. That. It's just you, you're right. You could get a fancy. Yeah. Dark chocolate. And it so. may be the exact same piece of chocolate, but because it came out of like a fancy wrapper, you're like, oh, this is better. That's right. But it might not actually be. (laughs) No, I appreciate that. All right. Um, Oh, dude, one time we, uh, a good buddy of mine, we were making s'mores, and he pulled out a white chocolate and put it on. It was, I think it was like a Hershey's white chocolate and put it on the s'more. Uh, That tastes pretty good, but. Really? I I don't know. I'm not a white chocolate. I don't even know if white chocolate is chocolate. We should, we should look into that. Um, now we also, since we are sitting by a campfire, um, there is another saying: "By the playing of the drums, a scary story this way comes." Trip. Have you ever had something otherworldly, strange, interesting happen to you that you could regale us with? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, when you told me about this earlier, I got really excited because I have this one story that's like kind of a fan favorite when it comes to like my, our friend group okay. that I tell. Um, they always be like, dude, because I, I, when I first graduated college, I did social work. I was a social worker for about six months or something like that um, and figured out real quick that that was not what I was meant to do. Um, it, it's a, it's kind of a it's a cool job, but you know, in Dalton, Georgia, it's a small town. Um, it's there's just once you peel back the layers and start to see some of the uh, the problems that you're dealing with there, drug abuse and stuff like that. It it's it's, it's there's a lot of sad stuff, and um, you know, I'm, I have somewhat of a sensitive heart uh, when you know we talk about Hallmark. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyways. Um, my my story i was doing social work and uh, i basically would um go out to people's houses and like go sit with them make sure their house is like 
uh, and condition for them to live in, make sure they were taking their pills, make sure there wasn't any abuse, make, you know, just basically like checking up on these people, spending time with them. Yeah. So there's some creepy stuff happening in here as I, I tell I'm, the story. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> um, and uh, I started, uh, um, so yeah, I was, I was, I was doing social work and, and I was, I'd go out to these people's houses and one, one time they, I was the only guy at the place I worked at. And so they would send me to the more aggressive houses or people, whether it be a guy or girl that were just kind of more aggressive or something, you know, stuff wasn't 100% right. So I went to this lady's house and this was actually the last, I literally quit the day at like the night after this happened. I was like, I can't do this. This is terrifying. So I went to this lady's house and um, I sat down with her and she was schizophrenic, but she would tell me, she was like, yeah, I hear them at night. I hear them. I keep hearing them in the basement, blah, blah, blah. Um, but she didn't have a basement. So that was the, the weird thing. And I, I was sitting with her and I just heard like this, like, And it sounded like some sort of murmuring. And I was like, is that what you hear? She's like, yeah, I hear that. I hear that. And she didn't know. She thought that just she heard that. But I heard it too. And I was like, what's going on? Like, what is that? She's like, I don't know. They're just there. And I was like, dude, what? That That's not. Something's up here. So I went outside and looked around the house. And it was completely like... Uh, cemented in like there was no access and i was like talked to her i was like how do you get under there like what and she was like oh you can't like it's completely boarded up there's nothing there's no way to get down there and i kept hearing like these little noises and i was like you know i called my people and i was like dude i don't know what's going on here but she's not just hearing noise i heard noises too so there's something weird going here and then i quit <laughs> That was my creepy story. So there was just a there was knocking coming from the walls, and there's no way that any animal or anything could have. It, yeah. Dude, it could have been an animal. It could have been. Um, it could have come, I guess, under the ground, maybe. Right. That's the only. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, yeah. There, it could have been several things, but um, I just remember in the moment it being a distinct knock, like a hard knock. Didn't sound like any. I was like, yeah. Yeah. It. It just felt creepy um I just, i'm creeped out just hearing that right now and i was sitting in her house like just sitting there like is somebody about to freaking like, y'all don't pay me <laughs> enough to do this right <laughs> like what is going on here uh, and she was a sweet little lady um but she just thought that she heard that and that no one else did like she was like do you hear that because uh, you know with schizophrenia a lot of people know that they're schizophrenic they know that like for instance there's people looking at them out in the in the woods or whatever like i had this one guy who's always like yeah see him out there looking at me there was nobody there and i would say you know there's obviously nobody there he's like yeah i know but i can't not see that like that's just the reality they live in um and so she kind of knew that she was schizophrenic and but it shocked her that i heard it <laughs> she was like wow you heard that yeah whether we were hearing the same thing or not in her mind, I'm not sure, but in, in the moment, I was like, yeah, I cl like I clearly heard that. Uh, and she kept saying, yeah, they're just down there. Like, they're just wanting to come up. And I like weird stuff like that. And I was like, what the heck? So anyways, yeah, I went, I told my advisor and then I quit. Man. Man. And I'm sure, I don't know if they sent anybody out or Dang. I'm sure she did get someone else, but. Wow. Yep. That, <laughs> that, that creeped me out. Uh, enough for me to be like you know I just don't think this is for me <laughs> and there were several instances man there were like um, several weird things that happened that, with that job that um, you know like a lot of the houses I went to were like dudes that had some sort of drug abuse or something like that yeah. and I would go out to their cabin in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone service and it was like dude anything could happen right now <laughs> like dang and yeah, it gives you a respect for people who dedicate oh, their lives to that. There's there it's a it's a a lot more difficult job than I think most people realize, you know, because 
uh, you're dealing with people that aren't necessarily mentally stable and you're putting yourselves in their environment basically not really protected you know totally. like there's there's there anything could happen and so um yeah i definitely have a lot of respect for people who who do social work and and um that just care about people that can't necessarily uh protect themselves or defend themselves or you know need someone to help them kind of live somewhat of a normal life totally uh scary in a different way but trippy you guys played a festival in las vegas oh yeah and it was the you got to perform the day before Mm -hmm. the one of the best one of the biggest crowds we've had at that time we were in what's called the next from nashville tent and what was super sad is like i think we had maybe four or five thousand people underneath that little tent um and they were just like out the back like it was the biggest crowd at that specific tent that we'd ever have and we'd played a bunch of the next from Nashville stages and um like weeks and weeks after that it was just tons of posts of like people who had lost their loved ones but had taken a photo in front of um us playing with their loved ones and that person had passed away um and it was you know that was what's really weird is we stayed in that we were staying in the hotel that he was in that whole weekend. Wow. Um, and cause you guys played the day before the massacre happened. Yeah. Right? And my parents were actually in town that we played that night. We played that night and the next morning we, uh, we were going to film the bachelor in Lake. Uh, what's that lake called? That's right. Your song is used in the bachelor, right? Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, we were, so we played on Saturday that Sunday morning we flew from Vegas to uh, Lake Tahoe and um, my parents had stayed and we, we were asked if we wanted to stay. And if we would have stayed, we would have been backstage or in the pit or in the like uh, sound booth watching Jason play. Cause I mean, we had passes, we could go just about wherever you want there and there's no telling where we would have been when that happened or if, if anyone would have, you know, gotten shot or anything like that. But my parents stayed behind and they were going to go see Jason. You know, I had them tickets set up and everything, but I had told them about this restaurant called Nobu and they were going to go Friday. And one of the people they were with got sick. And so they were like, instead of going to Jason, they wanted to try that restaurant. So they went to that restaurant or else they would have been in the crowd. Um, wow. And man, it, I can't tell you we we were getting phone calls as it was going on um at at like 11 o'clock and then the news kind of covered it dude it is the most helpless slash like i don't think any of us slept for three or four days in a row after that and what was weird is like the next morning we had to wake up and do sound check for that show and it just didn't feel right like we sat down on the drums and it didn't feel right like it, it, everything just kind of felt super somber and um and it was super weird but i will say man i commend the country community country music community because um a lot of people you know to this day when we play shows we have people come up all the time and say that they saw us at that show and that they were in the crowd and they survived it and 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 that kind of thing and that just goes to show you that like humans like we want to feel love we want to feel a part of something and there's always going to be a bad human like there's always going to be evil bad stuff that happens but um we're not going to let that stop us from going out and playing music and and shed uh, sharing hope and 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 being with people because you know what that guy did was such a cowardly thing and and i think it was um you know it's 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 super sad um but the growth that has come from that i feel like um it's i think it's made the country community stronger Amen. so on a little bit of a, a brighter note um i read that you guys say friends first and that you're a band second yeah uh 
tell us about that. Is is it? Are you all best friends, and the band is just a thing you're doing right now? And it's it's, it's interesting, man. You know, like because the last eight months we haven't had to be a band. There's there have we haven't needed to be together. That we are. It hasn't been on the schedule, for lack of a better term, for us to be together the last eight months. Yet we're together every other day. You know, like uh, it's we just hang out. You know, we'll some of us will fish, some of us will will have a fire. You know, every every the first when it when it for quarantine first hit, people weren't getting out, and so we all kind of like went our separate ways for about a month. And I mean, we were on text thread and talking and that kind of thing, but we didn't actually physically hang out. And then it kind of lightened up and everything. Um, the cases were kind of down here in Nashville early on and uh so yeah we've just been getting together and you know we'll write we'll we've been jared built a studio behind his house we'll get together and make music um we'll just hang out our wives are friends we're all friends and, and so you have a family yeah yeah it is it's it's interesting thing to have in your uh 30s is is like i just turned i'm 31 i've just turned 31 and what's interesting is like um I didn't think at 31 I would have a group of friends that were family at this age. You know what I mean? Like a community like that. Um, it's super cool. And, and everybody in our community, they're, they're good Christian people. They, they have families and, and, uh, we like, we love to work. We like, we work hard, we work real hard, but we also love to hang out and have fun. And, and we do that together. So, That's great. um, yeah, you've, man, you've mentioned, so I'm curious too, because I, you know, listening to your songs too, they, they seem to really celebrate. I don't know if wholesome's the word, but uh, I mean, it, it's it's cool to see music about, um, you know, talking about your, you know, loves for your wives, you know, right. and save me, and uh, or the little moments, and I see this, um, you know, that when you, um, you're just commenting on ordinary moments. I think it was like this side of heaven, you know, little yeah, little yeah, glimpses yeah. this side of heaven, and greatest loves. There's there's a realness and a, and you guys seem to be pretty just you seem pretty celebratory of something that you know the world doesn't really seem yeah. to prize as much and uh, is that is that just are y'all do y'all have strong christian roots and that's where it comes from or is that just you know upbringing is it both for sure i, I think uh, all of those play some sort of a part in what uh makes us lanco you know we all have really great parents we all um have beautiful wives and and uh we all are christians go to church that kind of thing but you know what's cool um that we i feel like one of the things that we really like to do is uh we do this thing uh, probably about once a year it's called a thankful circle where we go around and with our whole community it's like 30 of us and just say what we're thankful for that year or if it's someone's birthday we'll do a thankful circle for them and we go around and say what we're thankful for about them mm. but the biggest thing man is like i feel like um we're really self-aware and thankful for everything that we have and uh you know it's cool because in our music we like to celebrate normality you know like i i, I think a lot of times people you know listen to a certain genre of music and it's fantasy you know like all the rings and cars and houses and all this stuff and yeah that stuff i'm sure you know it's great but for us those it, it, i really do think that the little things are the biggest things you know what i mean like i think those little moments in life are the ones that are the most valuable you know i, I don't think any amount of money can can um, buy you a great friend you know what i mean um or a, a group of friends that you get to yeah be with together and you know it's when you think we've we've gotten to do some of the craziest and coolest things because of music and experience the world together and do all these really cool things yet for some reason when we are talking about memories they always are at one of our houses around a fire or the memory that comes up that stands out the most you know what i mean and so um you know for us it's it's when it comes to writing i think there's an aspect of us looking at what our lives were um, when we when we weren't touring and pulling a lot of the um, normal things that everyone experiences but sometimes are easy to take for granted and and 
kind of putting those on a pedestal and saying these are the moments that you should that that we live for that you should live for that you should be conscious of when you're in the middle of them because like dude again like i said it, it's never the big moments that we sit around and go god i cherish that it's always those little moments that um everyone has access to in their backyard that i think are the most important moments in life mm. that's cool man um how long have you been married nine years how did you meet your wife we grew up together um we're both from dalton georgia um she uh she and i were in like the same friend group growing up but we didn't start liking each other like dating or anything like that till we were 16. um and then um we kind of started dating and she uh i think it's because i i got a big red jeep like it's an older jeep but i had big tires and i pulled into the parking lot and she saw me driving I think that's what got her. That's right. The Jeep. That's right. That's, um, that was a good sponsorship right there. Yeah, it was a Jeep Wrangler. <laughs> Jeep um, Wrangler, nice man. But I uh, know we um, we've been together for a long time, and it's been cool too. You know, she's gotten to experience a lot of this. You know, she's gotten to see me at the bottom growing this thing. Um, so it's cool to kind of go through life uh, with someone and them getting to see you from a 16 year old boy to a 30 year old man, 31 year old man. Um, that's great. And I think that's, you know, I don't think necessarily a ton of people get to experience that, but for Allie and I, it's been cool to watch each other grow through different seasons of life. Oh, man. Um, all right, so we have a little tradition, too, on this show. We like to ask uh, a couple questions of all the guests. Uh, one, being a married man, mm -hmm. what is something that uh, you should say to your wife and you don't say it enough? Um... For me, I you know I'm super th super thankful for my wife, so I think uh, telling her that you're thankful for her is is super important. But also acknowledging all the things that like men are kind of stupid. Like <laughs> we kind of just do exist somehow. Yeah. And women are so detail oriented. Like my wife does so many things at the house that I don't notice, but every once in a while I'll be like dang that's clean how did that get like that or wasn't you. <laughs> when did they move when did this chair move here by this thing this looks awesome it's cool and so i think you know acknowledging little things like that um are important as well that's awesome um who do you owe big time that you could never repay huh probably brandon our lead singer i mean um you know er, early on he he was a um he, it was just him and he had all these songs uh, so to bring me in and let me join and it just be me and him in a band and then bring the guys in and him kind of give us equal share in the band uh, I think that's you know I think that's super cool um, I don't know that I'll ever be able to repay him unless I just write like a massive hit for us here in the next couple of years but hey, um, we'll work on it you know fishing song man that's yeah <laughs> I've got an idea I just need to <laughs> need to sit down and tangle with it but um yeah um yeah and he and and my wife you know i i don't know that i'll ever be able to repay her for you know putting up with our lifestyle on the road and, and especially going into a season of having a kid and knowing that she's gonna have to spend you know three or four days sometimes a week at a time yeah raising a kid without me i think that's uh that will come with its challenges but um i'm just saying in advance i'm thankful that's awesome <laughs> And for those, for that uh, drummer in the back of a shed facing legal persecution yep. from law enforcement, uh, yep. who all he wants to do is bang on the drums all day. Mm -hmm. uh, what advice, what piece of wisdom do you have for the next generation of Langos? Yeah, um, the biggest thing that I've found is that there are about three or four places in in the United States that you you should probably move to if you're serious about it because that's where all the managers um, labels booking agents um at least at least to get connected once you get connected you can kind of once you're touring and stuff you can move wherever you want to but uh, i think you know it's very important to be around new york nashville or los angeles because i think that's where the majority of the artists are 
that are looking for drummers um, because I think you know you can move to Nashville and and play in early on um, once you when you have your chops up you can you know meet 15 random people in Nashville at any given bar and join 15 different groups and before you know it you know you're someone's looking someone's drummer got sick or quit midway through a tour and someone's looking for a drummer and you have all these connections and um it's to me i don't know i wouldn't be where i am playing music professionally if i hadn't moved to nashville so i think it's i think it's super important to be where the action is um that would be like you know if you're you're asking someone where do you if you want to be a deep sea fisherman um what would be your advice it'd be like you got to move to where the ocean is you know what i mean like you can't do it can't do it on from percy priest kansas, Lake. Right? <laughs> yeah you can't do it from kansas so um i think all the action is happening and, and you know find a music city uh, a place where music it, it's important that there that the industry is there and because that's what brings all the people trying to get into the industry and that's where you get you know your opportunities to to play for those people that's awesome. And uh, you've got some new music coming out in yeah. January? Yeah, we have new music coming out in January. We're really excited about. Um, it's That's been the cool part about uh, being um, closed down from touring for the last eight, six, eight months is that we've been able to write and record a lot. So um, we have some new music coming out in January, and uh, I think we're going to you know release every six, eight weeks, something like that, a new song going into the new year so look for that look us up on uh spotify or wherever you get music and be looking for the new stuff absolutely well unfortunately all good camping trips must come to an end and i believe the temperature is actually authentically about 28 degrees outside right yeah, i don't now. think the fire's helping anymore i don't think the fire's helping so we gotta go but Trip, thank you for camping with me, man. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I hope to carry you through a crowd someday and see that, <laughs> see that inflatable duck by person. Next time we're in San Diego, we will make that. Fish happen. tacos, my man. Fish tacos. <laughs>